week we talked about government and we talked about our relationship as Christians to our government and Peter's basic statement is is that you should be respectful of your government this is your basic relationship to your government you do so because you are God's chosen people and then we talked about because we're God's chosen people we have other obligations other than just to our government and if our government and those obligations collide then we find ourselves in a place where we have to consider things like civil disobedience and we frame some of that up but we established a basic relationship that Christians have to government So this week we're going to look at another relationship. We're going to look at the relationships between masters and slaves. And we're, we're going to modernize it a little bit, but we're going to look at it in the exact same scope that we looked at it before, that we looked at the relationship that we have with the government. And I think as we do so, we'll draw some conclusions that I think are useful for both thoughts for masters and slaves relating to each other, as well as for how we relate to government. So I'm going to start in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure patiently, God is pleased with you. Okay, so first thing I think we need to sort through here is how do we take a message that's talking about slaves and apply it to us today? Because none of us in this room is a slave. And when, maybe to the next point, when we think of slaves, we think of the sort of slavery that was practiced in Western culture and in, in the U.S. And, you know, for the past 500 years or so. That is our reference point when we say slave. That's not necessarily what being a slave meant in biblical times. In fact, scholars estimate that up to a third of the Roman Empire's population was slave. So at that number, you're looking at something that was solidly ingrained in the backbone of Roman society, and Roman economy. It was so much more integral, you know, versus if, if you take a look at um, slavery in the U.S., less than 2% of Americans even owned slaves. So the scope of slavery in, in old world terms is much larger. Old world slaves came in a very large variety. They came from you know, various ethnicities. They did a variety of jobs. They could be doctors, they could be teachers, they could be laborers. They could be store clerks. Basically, any profession could be done by a slave. Slaves in the old world were encouraged to be educated. Many slaves were more educated than their masters. Slaves were allowed to own property, including other slaves. As a general rule, old world slavery was a temporary arrangement. Most individuals who were 
slaves were released around age 30 or so, the vast majority. The idea of old world slavery wasn't meant necessarily to be a lifelong commitment. Doesn't mean that it might not be, and it certainly could be. But that wasn't necessarily what was normal. <clears throat> Individuals could be sold in as slaves. The father of the Roman household had a lot of power over his family and had the ability to sell any member of his family to another individual as a slave. You know, that child of yours doesn't toe the line, you could sell them out. If you needed to pay debts, you could sell yourself. You, if you were struggling to get a job and needed to be provided for, life as a slave might be easier. And there'd be individuals who would choose to become slaves for that reason. Because at least it meant it was a steady job with steady income. It's a very different reality than what we think of when we think of slave. Because we're, when we go back to, I think we all think of American slavery, you know, abuse, menial labor, racially decided, Slave until death, no hope, no future beyond that. This is not necessarily for me to step back and say that old world slavery was morally acceptable. I don't necessarily want to go so far as to say that because abuses still existed. And as a slave, you could be asked to do awful things and expected to do so. But nevertheless, the conclusion I think to draw from it is, is that there is a large component to being a slave at this point in time is a working relationship. And that's the heart of what old world slavery realistically was. Like I said, barring abuses that occur largely again to the power that the father had of the Roman household. So if we can step back and say the slave and his master have a working relationship, I think we can take this scripture and apply it to our working relationships as well. And I kind of don't, I, I, I want to do that carefully because this particular piece of scripture was the backbone of how Christianity justified slavery as it occurred in the new world for the past 500 years. And I think that's something that Perhaps we're not necessarily tied to those decisions and the culture and even some of its ramifications today. I still think as students of the Bible, that's something for us to know about this particular passage, that this passage was used to justify every atrocity of you know, American slavery. So with that thought in mind, I think it's important for us to be able to scale ourselves back and say, hey, there's a difference between the two institutions. And what Peter is talking about here doesn't apply to what happened in the United States and other Western countries. So, working relationships. How many of you have had a boss that you worked under that you did not like? No, not, not many. I, I had one. <laughs> a, a, a boss you didn't trust. Yes. Yeah. Me, I only work for myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
Although that, that, that's when you need to be careful if your kid starts <laughs> I worked for an employer that was difficult to work for for various reasons. It was a difficult employer. And at one point in time, I, I was one of the night shift managers. <clears throat> I observed the other night shift manager stealing cases of Canadian bacon. He would set the case of food out with the trash at night. So it would go into the trash pile. And every evening, the supervisor would pull the security tape, because you know, this is back when you saw like VHSs that you popped into your security system. Old school, right? So you pull the tape out, and for that chunk of time, cameras aren't recording, and you would put the new tape in. So during that chunk of time that things weren't being recorded, you know, 30 to 40 seconds, the trash would get run, and the food product that he was taking would go up with the trash. Then he could collect it after work, you know, from the dumpster. And I reported him to the owner after I found found this happening. I'm like, I need, I, I, I needed, I, I felt I needed to report. I reported it. The owner conducted her investigation. There was no proof of my claim, other than inventory being slightly off. It was never off by a lot. He, you know, he wasn't necessarily taking a, enough stuff to be easily noticed. And my employer came back and said, I don't think he's doing this. I don't think he's smart enough to pull it off. That's what my employer said. That was her verdict as, as she settled the situation at the end. And the other guy who I reported, you know, you know, came to me and said, you know, Mike, I was mad at you for about the first hour after I found out what you had done. And then I realized I would have been more disappointed in you had you not just not reported me, because that's how I know who you are. So I look at the situation as one like, gosh, I stuck my neck out on the line. And nothing came of it other than me being a witness to the person who actually was guilty. But when he, when he said, why was he doing it? He's like, I don't really need that much hand. It was like, it was just my way of getting even. I was, didn't like how the boss was treating me. And this was my way of trying to get back. How tempting is it for us when we're in situations with employers that we don't necessarily I can get along with. How tempting is it for us to try to get even? Doesn't necessarily mean that we steal a case of ham. But I think there is a real temptation that some of us do have in our working relationships to, gosh, did, did my boss earn my best work? Gosh, if my boss treated me a little bit better, Maybe I would take the couple extra steps that I know I should do, but don't necessarily have to. You know, we give 80% of our best instead of 100%. Okay, speaking to some of you as employers, how many of you have had employees that gave you 80% of their best and you knew it? How do you think about that individual? Disappointment. There's disappointment in that. The idea here, and I think, and I think it. I think this is where this is where Peter's going, and 
again, this is where he came from when he talked about with government in terms of developing a reputation. As Christians, we will have a reputation based off of our work ethic. And if our testimony is that we are a people that are 80% because we don't like the master, that's going to be something that's going to reflect on all of us as a whole and it's not going to reflect well. And again, Peter is stepping back and saying, holy living and how we present ourselves to the world matters for the gospel. And it matters for the message. I find verse 19 to be very penetrating to our reality as a Christian. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. It is good to suffer unjustly. It's good for us to suffer in order to protect our witness and reputation as Christians. And I think that sometimes it's hard to hear because nobody likes being the victim. Our culture very much so rejects that notion. Our culture says, as an individual, you take care of yourself first and foremost. And you make sure that regardless of what happens, you are not in a place that's going to be vulnerable. Our culture says you don't tolerate someone taking from you that which you that's with that which is yours. Our culture says you fight back. But that's not necessarily the advice that Peter is giving here as he's talking to you know, masters and slaves, talking to slaves of the master. Yes, maybe there's something here that you feel that you have in terms of rights that you should be fighting for, but Peter's not telling them to fight for them. Peter's telling them to submit. I think that's a really hard message to hear. Gosh, because, you know, I mean, you're at work and there's that promotion that you didn't receive and you didn't receive it, not because you didn't earn it, but because the boss decided to give it to someone else for a non-meritable reason. You got, you got overlooked, you got treated badly, and you know, I think the message there that Peter has is you still have to submit. Like we talked about last week, the call to submit to the employer isn't based on the employer's merit. Just like the call to submit to government wasn't based on the government's merit. You have to submit in either case. But perhaps one of the biggest differences that we need to recognize when we think, when we think of our working relationships is not being slaves, we have the right to walk away from the job. Old world slave in a bad working situation, they don't have the option to say, okay, I quit. We do. And I think that poses a couple of questions and options of how this would apply to us that wouldn't necessarily be realized by the original audience that would have heard it. Because we can make the decision to be, to say, I cannot tolerate that working situation, I am going to leave. 
And that decision may be one that creates suffering. Because sometimes jobs aren't easy to come by. And so there could be a call for individuals to give up a job that they needed and suffer as a result. Or there could be a call to individuals to remain in a job that they feel like they're suffering in because that's the reality of where their life is. I think the call can go both ways and I think that's a question that the original audience would have never had to ask. But the question is, is are we willing to suffer to leave a job for righteous reasons? And are we willing to suffer to endure a job that we need in the, in the space? Because there's lots of individuals that aren't okay with that either. Nevertheless, the reality of verse 19 for us as Christians, that it is good to suffer for some of us, it comes as a shock. I think some of us know better, but maybe as Christians, we like to think that our path isn't going to have suffering in it. I, I, I think it's a thought that Christians would like to, many, many Christians would like to have, and I think some of them do. And I think this is a good example of a verse that steps back and says, suffering is a normal part of the average Christian walk. And if you're suffering, it's not because, you know, you're sinning or you have a lack of faith or any other personal fault. There, there, there is a strong vein of Christianity that teaches that. You know, that earthly suffering is a result of human sin. But here, earthly suffering is an opportunity to advance the gospel. Of course, you'll get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing good and endure patiently, God is pleased with you. How many of you have had the experience with one of your children to where you, your child does something, you, you deliver your punishment, and then your child, you know, after receiving their punishment and experiencing their punishment, Acts like they have been, acts like they are an injured person. You know? Oh, woe is me. I am being punished. <laughs> Do you feel sorry for your child in that space? Often not. Because you step back and say, well, you earned that punishment. This isn't a woe is me experience to where you are being punished unjustly in your suffering that you are currently going through because of your punishment. In that suffering, you get no reward. So it's true with us. If our suffering is being generated from the fact that we decided to rebel against the, the employer, we stole the ham and we get fired, the suffering that comes from that situation is not one in which we will be given reward for. Because we earned our beating. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered. For, for you, he is your example, and you must follow his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away and now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. See, the call that we have is to suffer like Christ. 
And I think Christ is the ultimate example of what it looks like to suffer unjustly. Because none of Christ's sufferings did he earn. What would the consequences have been if Christ would have chosen not to suffer unjustly? I think all of us would be on the losing end of that deal. God's entire plan was based on the fact that Christ would suffer unjustly. For us. God's entire plan is completely changed if that doesn't happen. One of my personal favorite Christian music artists is named Kathy Dracoli. I'm going to guess there's probably some people in here who even recognize that name. And um, she had a song, has a song called For the Life of Me. And I'm going to read the chorus here. For the life of me, I can't understand why you love me like you do. For the life of me, I can't comprehend why I mean so much to you. But maybe someday and forever, the answer will be clear to see that you did what you did all for the life of me. The very fact that we have life. is because someone was willing to suffer unjustly. I think this is one of the boldest things that Peter says to us. Because he encourages us to submit and suffer in the face of oncoming trauma. I think because the kingdom was built on that kind of suffering, and that's what we are, how we are to emulate Christ. You know, Christ left everything in the hands of God, although he did not have to. Christ very easily would have had the ability to answer back at any point in time. You know, when Christ is erect, arrested and Peter slices the ear off of the guard, now Christ is very quick to say, no, no, we're not resisting. We're not about that kind of fight. And he steps in and he performs a miracle to a person who's about to oppress him. It's a Christ-like, and it, that Christ-like attitude is the source of our life. And so the question for us to ask is, how can, what can be done in the kingdom from our unjust suffering? How can God use that and leverage that for the kingdom like he did in, with Christ? couple of takeaways, I think, from this passage. We can imply the command of obeying masters to obeying our employers, and how we work impacts our testimony as individuals and does reflect on Christians' corporate. <clears throat> we may be called to suffer in the workplace or as a result from leaving it, and suffering is a natural part of our walk and something that God can use to further the kingdom. We are called to endure as Christ endured. We have life because Christ suffered unjustly well. So we might bless others by suffering well. I will close this in prayer.